Welcome to the bullpen. All right, he's back, Mr. Spike Cohen, 2020 Libertarian Vice Presidential Candidate. Uh, there are many calling for him to run for president uh, in this election. We shall see if he makes that announcement. Um, we're going to chop it up about Biden and if it seems as if he's at a place of no return. Uh, Mr. Cohen, good day. Welcome to Indisputable. Thank you for having me back on, Rashad. It's always great. Always good to have you, dear brother. All right. Um, I'm looking at polling data. Um, I have a pretty good grasp of some of the trends. I don't want to resume what you know, believe about the pointed question. So if you would give us your sentiment, I would then opine. Yeah, so I think that this is one of many examples of how Joe Biden is slow walking his party and his can his his administration into an electoral loss. Um, they are ignoring a, a growing voting block within the Democratic Party, which is uh, over a million uh, Muslim voters. Uh, the vast majority of whom break for Democrats. And especially when you look at where they tend to be concentrated, which is in a lot of swing states, just a significant loss of that vote could be enough if all other things are equal to tip yeah. the balance to to Trump winning. And uh, I think that they're, they're whistling past the graveyard on all of this. Let me read some of the uh, ratings as they have kind of declined. So in 2021, April 9th, 2021, Biden's job approval rating was at 55.2%. That's actually high for a president, by the way. So 55.2%, it was favorable. Yep. Um, Afghanistan withdrawal, uh, a couple other things happened, it started to decline. So now you get to 2022. Uh, 2022, it goes down. And then he's now at a negative of 55.5%, negative, negative. All right, uh, and you have, in my humble opinion, dear brother, one of the most incompetent individuals on the Republican side uh, vying to be president of the United States. And that's what makes it even all the more embarrassing, in my opinion. The guy's literally giving you a layup, layup uh, and it's, it's difficult to defend. Um, but it's been downhill even more. You have a 15% point um, deficit as it relates to uh, some of our younger uh, voters that are the most energetic in the party, you yep. lose them, you lose your door knockers, you lose your people that make phone calls. Yep. You now have the Muslim Americans, as you just said, because of the mishandling of Gaza and his uh, uh, him aligning with the Israeli government, even when a lot of Israelis don't align with the Israeli government and what they're doing. Yep. This has been so counterintuitive. And I think the reason why a lot of Democrats are upset is not just because of Biden, it's because of the actual policies that Biden is supposed to champion being a champion of democratic policy. So a person is on the ballot, but really they, the, your policy is on the ballot. And if you ignore all of the political warnings, that means that you are, you are now endangering my policy. You're endangering my rights that I need you to advocate for because you seemingly do not care about being reelected. Uh, and then the most recent polling data showed Kamala Harris now is dipping in a way that she was somewhat immune to. I mean, she kind of hit a plateau yep. and now that's going under as well. The hell is happening. I think it's it's what you mentioned with policy. I think it's also a level of hubris, Rashad. If you'll recall, part of why he was elected in 2020, besides the fact that he wasn't Donald Trump, uh, was that there was a tremendous amount of anger over the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. And that led to protests. It also led to outrage over police brutality and qualified immunity and many other things. And so many of the people that were chanting defund the police voted for Joe Biden. Why I'm not sure because Joe Biden was the architect of most of what they were protesting, but we'll put that aside for a moment. Well, uh, he we, gets we can elected. talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll get, we can talk about that. He gets elected. Days later, he meets with civil rights leaders where he tells them, among other things, if he do, if they don't like what he's doing, to hell with them. Uh, and then he moves to triple federal funding for militarized policing. 
That was, in my mind, a microcosm of what the administration has been. Promising one thing, getting elected by a base that wants one thing, and then coming in and doing basically whatever they want and telling those same voters, well, what else are you going to do? You're going to vote Republican? Yeah. And I think what's going to happen is a lot, of, I don't think many of them are going to vote Republican, uh, but I do think a lot of them are just going to stay home. And yeah. especially in this case, when it comes to Israel and, and Palestine, I think a lot of people might look to other parties. For example, the Libertarian Party has been calling for ending aid to Israel for decades. Long before uh, this conflict or the Intifada of 2000 or any of that, we've been calling for getting uh, the uh, US government out of funding foreign regimes of any kind. And uh, we've also been calling for an end to US neocon foreign policy, which has killed millions of people. What's happening in Israel pales in comparison to the last 23 years of US foreign policy. And I think a lot of these people who have already decided they're not going to vote for Biden, they might very well vote for us, even if they don't see themselves as libertarians, just to vote for what is likely to be the only truly anti-war, anti-neoconservative party that will be on their state's ballot. Let me give you some insight as to why many of those who were involved in the movement still voted for Biden. Um, and many of them voted for Biden holding their nose, okay? Yep. But they voted for Biden because number one, the country is set up to where you do not have a selection, you have an election. And you know the difference in that. Oh yeah. And this uh, election has already selected the two corporations that will produce the individuals that must be president of the United States. Yep. And, and in that process, you really only have to work for about 7.5% of the vote because your respective party gets you the rest. Yep. All right. If you're the Democratic nominee or the Republican nominee, you only need to get about 7.5% of the actual vote because the company, the Democratic Party or Republican Party gets you the rest. So that's how they have a lock. And then black folk in particular, we're in this position where we're choosing from bad policy and worse policy. And when you compare Donald Trump literally calling Black Lives Matter protesters um, terrorists and creating false narratives about them intentionally and also subscribing to the very same ideology that they are antithetical to, mm -hmm. how do you embrace, how do you openly embrace um, a Republican of Especially course. top ticket Republican who's signing off on the rhetoric. There may have been some local nuances, but top ticket Republican, not so much. Let's get back into um, one of the, the trends that I am seeing. There's this, a lot of people are interested in politics that they weren't before, all right? Uh, if Trump did anything that can be seen as a, uh, a silver lining, uh, he woke some folk up. He also woke some folk up, I would have preferred stay asleep. Uh, and these individuals are now part of the political mainframe, right? They, yep. they, they tell you exactly what they want. I mean, some people are saying, listen, I want Trump to remain president forever. Um, I, I do not want him to ever give up the presidency so he can bring our country back. Like These things are, are fundamentally adverse to democracy. All right, we can all agree to that. And you have literally people voted for him, not wanting him to uphold the constitution, not wanting him to uphold principles and policy. This is a new modern dynamic because while some people may have held these sentiments very secretly, they are now saying these things out loud. And, and, and now there's this argument that may need to be pushed. And I want you to, to tell me your thoughts on it. While policies obviously are imperative and it's the goal in politics, mm -hmm. the policy on the agenda this time could very well be democracy itself. What say you to that argument? I think it's the only argument that's going to have any real pull right now. It's going to be hard to look at economic conditions. It's going to be hard to look at, as you said, the actual policy. And frankly, I mean, especially after the special counsel report, it's going to be hard to look at the actual man, Joe Biden himself, and say, that's why I'm voting for Joe Biden for president. It's almost going to have to be entirely the argument of, well, we're saving democracy. The problem with that argument is that they're essentially arguing in order to save democracy, we have to vote for this one person. Anyone else that you vote for and democracy is over, which is sort of a contradicting argument to make to begin with. There's also the fact that whether real or perceived, a, an increasing number of Americans think that the uh, act of prosecuting uh, Donald Trump and to then act to try to remove him from state ballots, not only is a, a, a political hit, but also an, in and of itself an act against democracy. Whatever you think of Donald Trump, the act of trying to remove him from, from the ballot. Uh, so it's going to be a hard argument to make. And I think if you end up in a situation, which is the situation that the Democratic Party and the Biden administration and Biden campaign are in, where the only real argument they're making that has any kind of traction is you have to vote for us or democracy is ruined, 
while kind of simultaneously undermining that argument, it's going to be a hard one to make. And like you said, they're working on voting for a small margin of voters. Muslim American voters are part of that small margin of voters that are gettable either by getting them to vote Republican or just not vote at all or vote for the Libertarian Party or the Green Party or something else, especially when you consider where they're concentrated. In Georgia, which Biden won by about 12,000 votes, 61,000 Muslims voted in Georgia, the vast majority of them for Biden. Similar numbers in Pennsylvania and Michigan, uh, even in Virginia. This could be the difference. Just the Muslim American vote in a close enough election could be enough for Joe Biden to lose. And that's before you get into much larger voting segments like anti-war voters, progressive young people and things like that. This doesn't look good for the campaign. Yeah, you know, Democrats, uh, they have always had to win presidential elections by coalition building. And that has been the strategy and has also been the slam dunk, okay? Yeah. Republicans, when they get into office, they usually don't get into office by way of coalition building, but by voter base excitement in yeah. particular uh, dynamic happening in the country, take advantage of it, they articulate it well, they message it well. And they are able to get in because of the middle, all right? The middle goes to them. Now, the middle is much smaller than it has been before, all right? We used to have a lot of people that considered themselves nonpartisan. They're, they're in the middle. That number is shrinking considerably. People are more polarized. People are choosing sides. And I don't think, and you can give me your opinion on this, I don't think the old strategy of running toward the base for the primary and running to the middle for the general is how you win presidential elections anymore. What say you? I'm not sure if I agree with that. And I, I will say, especially for the Republican base and Republican leaning voters, I think it might still work for them. I mean, we shall see, you may very well be right. Uh, I think a, a thing that is going to be incredibly helpful towards getting the middle, which frankly, I'm not sure how much the middle has shrunk and how much of it has just stopped voting. Um, because I think we've but seen- that's a, a, That would be a shrinkage de facto then. A, yeah, yeah, a, a de facto shrinkage. But those are people that could still vote if they chose to. Um, I think a lot of the middle, which frankly, whatever size the middle is, it's it's larger than, for example, Muslim voters uh, right. as, a, as a block. We're talking now well over 10, 15, maybe even 20 million voters at the very least. Um, you know, When you get a special counsel report that says that they're going to decline to prosecute Joe Biden because he's, as they put it, an elderly man with a poor memory, and they think that- a a jury would be sympathetic to him and think that he didn't even remember what he was doing with classified documents. That is a huge, huge problem, especially when in his response, when Joe Biden did his press conference yesterday, reading from a teleprompter, he flubbed multiple times and including calling Egyptian President El Sisi the president of Mexico. In a press conference, he put together to say that he wasn't having declining memory problems. I think that you know it's going to be increasingly hard for people in the middle who are not as politically connected as us, don't really follow politics that much. They just kind of get a gut feeling of who they should vote for. And if they see one person who's acting like the same goofball he's been acting like since the 70s, and another one who seems to be having a cognitive decline in front of us, uh, I think a good number of them that may have voted for Biden in 2020 may end up voting for Trump in, in 24. Or, or sitting out. Now, here's the or other Or sitting thing. out, yeah. Right. Uh, Trump is so horrible that even with the gaffes of Biden, I mean, he's been a gaff master a long time. Now, right. now you have the cognitive uh, dynamic associated yeah, with yeah. it. Uh, that uh, tr Trump won't run away with anything because he's such a flawed candidate, yeah, right? Yeah. There, there was a time things like this would clearly contrast the challenger, all right, or the you know presumptive nominee of the Republican yeah. Party and the right now president of the Democratic Party. And even when we had our congressional elections, where Republicans vowed this was going to be a sweep, you're going to see this, this red wave. It didn't happen. Yeah. It didn't happen. And most of Trump's endorsed candidates lost. Yep. Yeah. They lost. So we first of all, I and I told you this before, I believe having multi parties, a multi party system is the absolute best way to go because it challenges the policy. Now everybody got to fight for the vote of people yep. rather than companies being able to purchase two sides of the same coin. Yep. I'm going to give you the last word, dear brother. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that the two party system has given us a person that 
very few people outside of his base want against the current president who we are watching sundown in front of us and whose policies are not what he said they would be. And he's gaslighting us or his administration is gaslighting us to believe, no, this is actually what you voted for and ignoring his voters and his base in the process. This is what happens when you only have two options and they're all owned by the same oligarchy. And this is what the two party system is. This is a big part of why I'm a libertarian is First of all, because I'm libertarian from a philosophical standpoint, I believe we have the solutions that America needs. Even if I wasn't a dyed in the wool libertarian as I am, I would still support multi party politics. Because if you don't like what I have to say, if you're more progressive, then vote Green Party. If you don't yeah. like what I have to say and you're more of a rugged constitutionalist fight uh, type, vote uh, Constitution Party. There should be so many options because the parties and the people in power should be competing for your vote, not taking advantage of it like Democrats do with Muslims and black people and young people and Republicans do with older people and, and, and white people people and suburban people and and you know uh, libertarian or, or constitutional leaning people they shouldn't be taking advantage of our vote or taking us for granted they should be competing for it and part of that competition should be actually delivering on the promises that they make and if they're not doing that then in my mind instead of voting for the party that tells the lies that I like more I'd rather vote for someone that actually reflects what I believe that's right and here's the thing dear brother you will not get out of that ecosystem until you get this damn corporate money out of politics like you have it. Because that always blurs the lines. And all of a sudden, an interest becomes a real thing. No, no, that's just a corporate interest. And we're fighting each other because of their framework. Always a pleasure. Go, always go a pleasure. And I'd love to come back on to talk about the roots of that as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dev, brother, that's the next debate then. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, dear brother. I appreciate it. You're a straight shooter. You don't gaslight. You believe what you believe. I believe what I believe. That's why I can always, always keep an open door for you. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, Rashad.